Okay, hi everybody and welcome to today's session of Virtually Golden. My name's Annie and I work with Golden United. Um, just a little bit of technical housekeeping. If you have any questions, please click the unmute button at the bottom left hand corner of your screen. You can chime in whenever you like, ask your question, and then um, just re-mute yourself whenever you're done so that we um, don't have any background noise disturbing the presentation. Um, other than that, feel free also to use the chat function if you want to use that instead of asking um, over the microphone. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kathy Smith, who's been spearheading these sessions for us. Kathy? Thanks, Annie. <clears throat> Hi, everyone, on this snowy day. Um, doesn't seem like it's going to stop anytime soon. Uh, we're happy to have Donna Anderson with us today to talk to us about the 1889 White Ash Mine disaster in Golden. Donna never meant a rock she didn't like. She has over 40 years of geologic experience, including over 25 years in the oil and gas exploration and exploitation. Don also has 20 years in academia at Mines, including research and teaching at both the undergrad and graduate levels. She has a bachelor's in earth science from Cal State Fullerton, a master's from UCLA, and a PhD in geology from Mines. Don is an active member and a leader in several professional organizations and served as president of the Rocky Mountain Association of Geologists and she's still serving on many committees and foundation boards. Donna is a graduate of the 2014 Leadership Golden class, and she's currently writing a book with co-author Paul Hazeman called Golden Rocks, the Geology and Mining History of Golden, Colorado. The book should be finished by the end of this year. Take it away, Donna. Okay, thanks, Kathy, and good afternoon to all of you. Um, and thanks for joining us in this talk about an episode in the history of Golden, about the White Ash Mine disaster. What we'll do in the next few minutes is talk a little bit about coal mining in Golden in the late 1800s. Then we'll talk a little bit about the geology, mining techniques, historic coal mines in Golden, and what Golden was like in 1889. And finally, we'll get on to the topic at hand and talk about the White Ash Mine and what I'll call its bad sister, the Old Loveland Mine and the events of 1889. Oops. Okay, so um, you might be a little surprised to know that there was a lot of coal mining in Golden. This was really a big deal. And in the 1800s, coal in general was the fuel of choice. And in Golden, it turned out to be obviously the fuel of choice, but it was for heating homes, people, uh, didn't, there were no trees in Golden <laughs> that grew natively, so they had to find something better for fuel, and we'll go into a little more about that. But in 1862, Edward Bertha, whose name was probably familiar to you, he was actually a civil engineer by degree, and what I'll call an avocational geologist, because he loved rocks. He found coal while looking on the west side of what's today's Mines campus, in, um, in one of these geologic formations. And he was actually the first guy to find coal in Golden, although it had been recognized to the north and south by 1860. <clears throat> and you may be surprised to know that historically, Golden had 12 or 14 coal mines, depends on how you name them, within today's city limits, which is actually quite a few. And I can see them here on the map on the right here of the city of Golden. And all of these were, um, all these coal seams were in a rock unit called the Laramie Formation, which we'll talk about a little bit. And so what's so special about this formation? Well, you actually probably know about it, whether you know or not. It's actually on the Fossil Trace Golf Course. It's part of the Triceratops Trail, where there's a lot of dinosaur footprints, Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops, a lot of palm tree fossils, among other plants. It has all those sandstone beds that stick up on the golf course. It's full of clay, and it's also what is the coal-bearing rock unit in Golden. And that coal was in up to 14-foot thick beds, which are also called coal seams by the miners. So why do we have so much coal in the Laramie Formation? Well, it represents an ancient swamp. So here is a depiction up in the upper left where my cursor is, of a, of a swamp and what the, den, the golden landscape might have looked at like 68 million years ago with standing water and trees growing all around it. 
and the trees would fall down into the water, which was kind of acidic, so they didn't decay very fast. So they slowly decayed over geologic time, got buried, and finally cooked into coal. So on the right-hand side here, there's a, a picture on the west side of Green Mountain where there's the North Chieftain clay mine. I was on a field trip last May, actually, almost a year ago. We were looking at the Laramie Formation there. And I wanted to show you what a coal seam actually looks like. And where my cursor is, along this black dark strip here, that's the coal seam. It's only here about maybe two feet wide. And so what was happening in Golden is the seam in Golden is almost 14 feet wide, something more like what my cursor is going across. There's also sandstone mixed in with this, and then coal and clay mixed together in this light gray rock here. So I just wanted to let you know this environment turned into these kind of rocks, and this is what provided the coal for mining in Golden. Well, one of the odd things about Golden is, um, I'll tell you a little geology. Sedimentary rocks like sandstone and coal usually get deposited flat or nearly flat. But in Golden, everything's tilted up on vertical. So here's this coal seam that started out flat and now it's up, up upright. And you can see a lot of these kind of rocks. This is over near the um, former widest coal mine on 12th Street. And here's some vertical sandstone beds. They're tilted up at 90 degrees. Here's a little clay seam and then another sandstone bed. So the problem with being vertical is you had to mine it a little bit differently than conventional uh, underground coal mine. So either the, you had to sink a shaft on the top of the coal seam so it went down, or you came in from the side and then went down. In any case, you had to make vertical shafts to mine the coal. And so if you cut away this little sandstone bed and then look at along the face of the coal seam in three dimensions, here's how they would mine it. You sink a vertical shaft, then you'd make a cross cut tunnel and you'd mine along the tunnel until it kind of played out. Then you'd go down to the next vertical interval and go along a tunnel like this and keep going down and along, down and along, so forth and so on. So this is really important to understand that in Golden, this is how the coal mining progressed and kind of keep this in mind as we get into the talk a little ways. So it turns out all the coal mines in Golden are kind of lined up in a north to south strip, and they're all aligned on this rock unit we call the Laramie Formation, which is this pinkish color. That's the outcrop of the Laramie. It goes all the way down past Morrison. It goes all the way up to Ralston and beyond. And um, one coal bed in particular was 14 feet thick, and it was called the White Ash Coal Seam. And it was called white ash because the coal had so few impurities that it burned totally to this fine white ash, which was really easy to get rid of. It didn't make a big pile of stuff. So it was very high quality, desirable coal. And that seam kind of went from where the arrow is right here. This would be around, um, this is the mines campus. And then it went all the way up north of Golden. All the mines were concentrated along it. And two of the first mines in the city were this white ash and Old Loveland mine. Um, and so now our story really begins. But just to step back and look in 1889 in Golden, um, the US Census data reports that it had about 2,800 people. So it was a pretty small town. And you may be surprised to know <clears throat> it was an industry center. Um, Golden had uh, up to five smelters, which were processing ore from Idaho Springs up, up in Clear Creek Canyon. It had three to four brick factories, and clay in a Golden is brick is a totally another talk. It had a couple of lime kills that were burning uh, lime to make mortar. It had the only paper mill west of the Mississippi. It had a brewery, and you might guess who that one was. It had one electrical generating station, which went online in late 1887. And then it had a major railroad yard, which was the Colorado Central, which ran steam engines. And every one of these industries used coal to fire their operations, not including um, homeowners that were using coal for heat for their homes. And so you can imagine that coal mine right in town was very valuable and a very, a very robust industry as, as it was. So let's look at the White Ash and Old Loveland mines. This is a, a circa 1885 photograph of Golden. And my cursor is tracing this, the, what the route of Clear Creek was through town. You'll notice it was quite wide. 
it really wasn't its natural channel. It hadn't been too much modified at that point. This is the Washington Street Bridge with the black arrow for reference. And then I'm tracing my cursor over to what is now 12th Street. And as you come down to the bottom of the photo with the circle, this is the white ash mine as it existed in 1885 at the end of 12th Street. For reference, this hill up here with the irrigation ditch running through it, that is now a parking lot at Colorado School of Mines. And off here near the creek, this is where the football field is. So just for reference, that's, that's the location of the white ash mine. Now this other mine that's important in the story is on the north side of Clear Creek. It's called the Old Loveland Mine and had other names too, but that's what it, in this set, setting we're gonna call it. It was only a third of a mile apart. The seam actually went under Clear Creek, so all the tunnels were under Clear Creek in the two mines. So this is kind of the setup we have to talk about the two mines. So first the Old Loveland Mine. Here in a picture around 1874, you can see the, the active headworks, the tailings pile. The, um, so this was where the shaft of the Loveland mine went down into underground. The Colorado Central Railroad tracks are on the uh, right hand side here and that's basically 8th Avenue today. Um, this little ditch in the side is the original alignment of Church Ditch. So this, this mine was somewhere around the 8th Avenue West Apartments. It really probably was in the right of way of Highway 58, but it's, it's kind of tough to tell, but that's about where it was in town. It started in 1872 and was abandoned in 1879. And it was abandoned because of a, a lot of carbon dioxide gas, which is really toxic. You can't breathe in that. And then that was followed by flooding. So the whole mine had been flooded and it was abandoned. But interestingly, the flooded mine shaft at the surface was used like a well to provide water for the steam boilers at the Golden Bricks Works, which were located not too far away in this general area. So basically they just took water out of the abandoned shaft and got it over to the brickworks to use for makeup water for their steam boilers. So now let's get to the White Ash Mine. And here's an 1890 view of the White Ash Mine with the tailings in the foreground. And in the distance, you can see the old Loveland, the, the abandoned ruins of the old Loveland mine tailings spot. So white ash began in 1878. The 14-foot the white ash coal seam that it was mining in, same with the old Loveland, averaged about six feet of really good coal that they would, they would actually mine out. The mine was producing 50 to 100 tons daily, which is, is really a lot of coal. And in 1889, it contained the deepest vertical shaft in Colorado at 730 feet below the ground. It employed 40 men working three shifts. So it was a real going concern. So now I want to kind of introduce you to the underground workings. And remember that 3D diagram I showed you earlier about what the coal face looked like? Well, this is, this is a diagram along the coal face of the white ash seam. So for reference, on the north is on your right side where the Loveland shaft was. Clear Creek bed is in the center. And then the white ash mine is over here on the south. And then you see the vertical shafts and then all the tunnels associated with the two mines. So um, one of the things that's really important to understand in this whole story is that in the white ash mine at the, what they call the 280 foot level, there had, um, it was separated from the Loveland mine by this area in the white circle, which consisted of 70 to 100 feet of coal and rock. So that's a real important part of the story. It turns out 1883, um, John McNeil, who was the state mining inspector for coal mines for the state of Colorado, who's a mining engineer, he inspected the white ash and other mines periodically. And he came because there was a coal fire burning in this tunnel at the 280 foot level. Now coal fires are common problems in, in, in coal mines, um, both working and abandoned ones. That's a big, it's a big issue. So he ordered the shaft, he ordered the shaft sealed up, hoping that by sealing it up here, you de deprive the fire of oxygen and it would just burn out on its own. And um, so they abandoned that part of the shaft and kept working deeper. But at the same time, he was also concerned, and this was not unique to White Ash Mine, but when you've got a, one shaft and you're working down on these other levels, there's not 
an emergency route out except to go back up the same shaft. And he mentioned this as a problem. But it, it, since it's such a common problem, that's kind of where it stopped. So um, kind of dialing forward to May and June of 1889, McNeil was going to, um, had re-inspected the white ash mine, and was going to order it closed because of um, rotten timbers in one of the shafts and, and cave-in concerns from that. He also got really concerned about the lack of this second way to get out of the mine because people were working down at the 730 foot deep level. But in July of that year, 12 miners working there petitioned him and the state to keep the mine open because they would suffer economic hardship if it closed. So the mine owners replaced the rotten timbers in July and August of that year, and they began to arrange for a second shaft to be sunk on the north side of the creek to, to get that second exit. Um, but in, in to ensure safety, McNeil gave the order that only 10 men at a time could be down in the mine for safety reasons. So that's, that's what they did. So here we go. On September 9th, 1889, around 4 p.m., the evening shift had just gone down to work at the 730-foot level. Charles Hoagland, the mine engineer, reported that the men sent up a signal to send down the cage. So they went down in a cage and they came, it came back up once they were let go in their shaft. It was lowered at once and went down to about six feet at the bottom of the vertical shaft and stuck something and apparently got stuck. And that at that point, they had heard nothing else. It, you can imagine what was going through these guys' minds. The foreman, Evan Jones, who really is one of my personal heroes as reading through all the accounts of this, listen to this, he went down on a ladder to the 280 foot level where the fire was burning originally, and he can't, had to come back because the air was so bad, he just couldn't breathe, so he came back up. So panic was starting to strike, I'm sure, and the men at the mine went over to that old Loveland mine shaft, wondering about it, around 6 p.m., and they found that thing to come be completely dry, which was, must have been the worst feeling in the world. As you remember, it was always filled with water, which was used at the Golden Print Company. So the people in town started gathering the mine. It was obviously a disaster in progress. And they were gathering throughout the evening and night, crazy with grief. Around 9 p.m., John McNeil was called, and he arrived at midnight. So I want to walk you through what happened when he got there at midnight, coming back to our um, cross-section of the mine workings. So when he got there at midnight, the whole white ash shaft was full of carbon dioxide. Um, nobody, you know, you could lower a light down two feet and it would go right out. Um, so basically, to see what was going on, they lowered a line down the shaft and found out that the top of water was about 100 feet off the bottom. They also found out that the uh, hoist cage had gotten stuck just above that. They could tell that on the line. Eh, I can't imagine what they thought. Um, so what they did is they started removing the CO2 gas in the shaft by running the ventilation fans. And by 3 a.m., they lowered another line with a, a, a light on it. These were not electric lights, by the way. That light went out right here at about 580 because CO2 gas was actually flowing in the shaft and it, it extinguished the light. Well, the, they kept lowering the line down. It had a temperature ga gauge on it. And they actually came back down to where the water level had been. It had risen a little bit, but they found out to their dismay and actual surprise that the water temperature was like 115 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very odd because as you well know, a lot of the water in, in Clear Creek is definitely a lot, lot, a lot colder than that. Um, so they were, they were kind of surprised and puzzled about that. So they kept running the ventilator fans to get the CO2 gas out. And this is what I find really amazing. By around 8 a.m. the next morning, that morning on September 10th, McNeil, the inspector, and Evan Jones, the foreman, felt it was safe enough for them to go down on a bucket to about 280 feet. So they did, they got in a bucket on a line, came down here, and they felt what they called intense heat. Uh, whatever that means. I'm sure none of us would feel comfortable about that. And then they kept going down to about here, and they could hear running water below them, which was really an awful feeling, I'm sure. And they were, you know, in, in the dark, and 
fighting bad air and bad conditions and they just decided they had to come back up. They just couldn't stay down there anymore. As they came back up toward that shaft that was, was he, very hot, they could actually see timbers burning in the shaft itself in this tunnel and realize that the fire in the coal fire hadn't gone out and it actually had resumed burning at a very intense level. So they came back out to the top and at this point, not only were the men's lives lost, but it was becoming pretty apparent that they weren't gonna be able to recover the bodies either. So I can't imagine what everybody thought. So it was just a tragedy. So, so what happened? So McNeil, being the mining engineer and state inspector, pretty much concluded that that pillar where number six is here had, had failed. And it had failed because that fire burning had actually burned the coal out and then the water pressure from the Loveland shaft basically caused the thing to break. The water from the Loveland shaft that is flowing across the broken pillar between the two tunnels was getting heated up as it came through the fire and then it was dropping down the shaft to the bottom. And, it, and actually not too long after this, maybe a couple weeks, the water level in the, in the white ash mine had actually come back almost to surface. So there was no way they were ever gonna pump it out. So they basically sealed it up and um, considered it a cemetery. So for about the last, for every year after 1889, for quite a few years, citizens would come to the, the site of the disaster, the coal mine uh, headworks, and lay wreaths at the site and um, have ceremonies and, and really commemorate what happened there. It, it was very fresh in everybody's memory. And 30 years later, in September of 1936, a permanent memorial to the 10 miners was placed above the location of the vertical shaft as a grave marker. Now that used to be on the west side of the football field. Um, and in 36, a lot of the people who attended that ceremony were relatives and friends of the men involved in the incidents. They were still around. Um, so Later, um, the memorial was moved to its current location, which is shown here on the picture. It's right at the end of 12th Street, uh, right across from Marv K Stadium. And a rededication ceremony uh, recommemorating the event was held on October 29th, 2016. And you can walk over there. It, it might not be a bad walk to do right now and, and see the memorial. It has the statue of the miner. These are the little oil wick lamps that they used to use to see down in the darkness dressed in the, the, the clothing of the day with the water and food buckets. And then the plaque, this is the original 1936 plaque to the 10 miners who perished uh, by drowning. You know, it's still regarded as one of the, the worst coal mine accidents in the state and certainly in, in uh, the front range part of urban Colorado. So it's just a, an interesting note in the history of Golden and, and just a testament to, to um, our cha a chapter in one of our uh, history in, in, in Golden itself. And so with that, I'd like to give a shout out to Golden United and virtually Golden Le Lecture Series to let me give this little talk. And I also wanna say I've consulted a lot of data on this and people, and a, a lot of times as historians will appreciate the data are conflicting. So I'll just put a disclaimer in that any mistakes I made in this are mine and no, nobody else's, nobody gave me bad information. I, I did it myself. So anyway, thank you very much and I hope this has been entertaining for you. And I'll take any questions. Wonderful. If you have a question at the bottom of your screen on the left-hand side, you can, un, you can click the little mute button, ask your question and then just re-click it, so. Dive in. Did they stop mining coal in Golden? Uh, no, actually, so if you don't mind if I go back to a picture, there's a mine called the New Loveland Mine, and then there's a new white ash mine that was, was constructed up here. So they closed the white ash mine they went and started mining up at the new White Ash Mine. After the old Loveland Mine was abandoned, the new Loveland had been started and it kept going. So basically coal mining kept going until about actively until around 1900. And what really killed it was the, um, 
There was a huge recession in the United States in 1893. I forget, there was actually a name for it. It was a big silver panic. And that really killed a lot of uh, industry. It messed up the mining up in Idaho Springs. And it, that kind of stopped the whole coal mining as fuel for industrial activities. Great, do we have any more questions today? Oh, here, we have one from Rick Flint in the chat. It says, where was the original memorial site before the current one on 12th Street was created? I can show you that in a picture too. Okay, so if we look at the, um, here's the white ash mine. So, um, I don't know if I can zoom in as much, but it was right at the west end of the football field, which was, um, oh, maybe, 50 or 100 yards to the west of where the where it is today on 12th Street. Donna, were all these mines owned by the same folks or were they owned by different people? Um, the short answer is they were owned by different people, but a lot of the owners were a combination of original settlers like Loveland was in and Charles Welch was in and then they shifted owners um, so it was, it was kind of similar groups of people, but not the same exact combinations. Great. Do we have any other questions today? Okay. Sounds like no. Um, Donna, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. That was fantastic. Um, and thank everyone for joining us today for Virtually Golden. We'll be back here on Thursday, no, Tuesday. Today's Thursday. <laughs> um, and Kathy is going to talk a little bit about who we have coming up next week. Thanks, Annie. Um, yeah, we're going to run these talks through the end of April. So uh, next week, we've got uh, Frank Blaha, who's going <clears> to <throat> talk about the great influenza pandemic of 1918, a uh, timely topic. And um, he will, I think, draw some comparisons with uh, current events. And then next Thursday, you know, th where our, with our various uh, history talks, we've heard about um, impacts on uh, Clear Creek, uh, industrial and mining impacts. And the current day impacts are recreational impacts. And, uh, Jim Ranville, who's a professor at Mines, will be telling us about recreational impacts on Clear Creek water chemistry. So hope to see everyone next week. Wonderful. And if you are ever wondering where you can access previous recordings, just go to goldenunited.org. We link to our YouTube channel there that has all of the previous virtually golden recordings available if you want to go back and listen again. And it also has the schedule for upcoming recordings through the end of the month. So thank you so much. And I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Thank well, you, all. Professor Dada. That was really interesting. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you back on Tuesday.